There we go. All right, good morning, everybody. We have Maximum Pups. It will hopefully uh, not be too distracting today. And let me get things going. All right, so I believe we left off with Mr. Tuxedo. And his uh, many toes. So let's kind of go back a little bit uh, because it, you know, it's a good idea to go oh, on, up you get up. There you go. Oh, what's she going to go do? Hmm. But you said you weren't going to be distracting. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Look at that. What a crazy ass dog. As uh, my friend Robert says, she's a skinny neck dog. Anyway. So I need to go back all the way to cis regulatory elements, right? So remember again, these are, uh, oh, fine, uh, DNA sequences that are present in the regulatory promoter, however ill-defined uh, that is. And those sequences are recognized by proteins. Right, so the the sequences that are present in that promoter and the proteins that are present in that nucleus dictate whether or not that gene is turned on or not. Right, and so we were talking about. So we have uh, uh, modularity of those uh, enhancers and also those suppressors too, all those silencers, and. Here we go. Um, those enhancers can be, you know, present a long, long, long way from the gene in question that they are part of controlling or they control a part of the control of, I guess, kind of awkward language. So the cell specific expression of particular genes, and there are an awful lot of genes which are expressed only in uh, one tissue or even one cell type within that tissue right so if you think about your uh, pancreas which um, probably many of you don't do on a regular basis uh, i tend not to think of my pancreas very much uh, but we have alpha cells and beta cells in the pancreas beta cells are the ones that produce insulin right so insulin is only produced in those cells as far as i'm aware but the uh, alpha cells produce uh, a hormone called, what is it, glucagon, uh, which uh, does the opposite to insulin. It signals cells, particularly the liver, to uh, turn glycogen, which is a storage carbohydrate, into glucose and release it. Right. So those two cells within the same tissue, pardon me have very different expression profiles, right? They have very different genes that are being turned on and off. And that is controlled by these uh, collection of enhancers. And silencers also kind of fall under the same uh, group in a sense, in that they are gene specific well, not gene specific, that's not quite the right way of putting it. Um, each gene has a specific collection of, in, of silencers and enhancers. You can find the same silencer in front of many different genes and the same goes with enhancers. In fact, if you look at this example, you'll see that there's a lot of uh, overlap 
right, between different genes as to which enhancers they have, right? And that essentially that collection is what uh, altogether equals the output of that gene under different conditions. And those silences are, uh, again, they're regions of DNA that are recognized by proteins. And those protein, proteins binding that can inhibit expression, right? So actively turn it off by a whole bunch of different mechanisms, right? They can either exclude RNA polymerase, right? So they could be very close to the core promoter, right? So they physically block RNA pol assembly. Uh, they could overlap with uh, one of these enhancers, so they could physically block uh, the enhancer protein, the activator from binding. And uh, what was the other? Ah, yeah. I mean, essentially, these first two things are the same, uh, same thing expressed in slightly different ways. Right. Does anybody have any questions about any of this so far? or what we have covered previously. I'm working on the assumption that there are people on the other end of the screen, hopefully. Now we're looking for scheduling. I'm glad I saw, that's, that's the whole plan. Uh, well, if anything comes to mind, just stop me. I'm that's really, you know, one of the big ways in which I can help you a lot. There we go. So we're actually a little uh, in out of it. Uh, behind the curve in terms of timing, but uh, that's also because I've really wanted to do the best job that I can uh, getting you the, the information. So uh, depending on uh, what happens today, hopefully we'll cover some fun stuff on Wednesday, but we should have at least one session for uh, recap and questions. So at the very least, you know, study the monkeys out of this over this week and bring any questions on uh, next Monday. Because don't forget, your last exam is the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. So it'll be a week on Wednesday. And then we're done, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. Always strikes me as like super odd, this whole uh, Thanksgiving break where it's at. It's like we have a break and then we come back, and we do like that much. And then we finish. It seems... Uh, Kind of weird. Okay, so uh, we're going to skip past Mr. Tuxedo, however alluring his paws are. And I think we covered uh, insulators and uh, how they function and their purpose, right? Largely to isolate uh, the effect of the enhancers for one gene from accidentally activating another gene. Okay, so next up is alternative splicing, right? So we have pretty much done the first two here, right? And in many ways, these are the kind of the heavy lifting in a sense, right? Where an awful lot of the complexity comes from. The RNA processing and uh, control of translation via either initiation of translation or degradation of mRNA. Those are, I don't know how best to put them, those are kind of more fine control deals, right? They, they affect fewer genes, right? So that it's not universal. Um, and their effects can be more subtle, I guess, is probably the kind of essentially the modulation deal. Remember we were talking about the fine tuning in uh, bacteria. So these are kind of ways of fine tuning, not the only ones, but 
kind of it's a good way of thinking about them i'd say in terms of fine tuning expression or the actual outcome and then we'll talk about uh post translational modifications of which there are many and we've got a couple of cool uh case studies to look at for that actually one of which <laughs> when i was waking making uh part of my wife's metal chicken Christmas present, uh, I actually found out myself because I sliced open my finger on a piece of metal. Anyway, so there you go. It's kind of like genetics in action. All right, so sure. Always. Uh, you stay there, dog. Let's see if I can drag it out without scratching the car. You lot are like absolute uh, worst at keeping me on track. I don't know whether that's intentional or not. All right, let's go out to my man cave. So this is where I have my workshop. So I have a... Um, metal lathe and uh, a mill. Let me just put this down here on my bench for a second. Thank you. I have to remember to cover everything up afterwards. So this is the metal chicken as it stands, literally. So uh, this is like one of the next pieces, you just have to kind of get this metal. It's really quite thick, which is unfortunate. And uh, bend it into shape and then stick it onto the chicken. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Good excuse to use my, uh, it's going to be huge. I actually reckon based on the gauge of metal, it's 18 gauge, I think, which is, I don't know, like a, millimeter and a half thick. Here's one of the the sheets that I got at the scrapyard. I reckon it's actually going to be probably shotgun proof and maybe even like 2-2 proof. I'm not sure about like heavier calibers, but uh, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a serious chicken. My dad reckons I should put like some red LEDs in its eyes to scare off like neighbor dogs and stuff. Anyway, <laughs> I know it's been, no, I haven't loved. Yeah, maybe if I can put like a little sandbox in it. Anyway, can't talk about it anymore because my wife is downstairs. So, doop, do, do. It's all like a, it's, obviously, it's a secret. Although it's going to get ever harder to uh, keep it a secret because <laughs> it's going to be uh, anyway. Anyway, that's a nice little uh, uh, distraction. All right, got to focus back on genetics. I can uh, I can work on my project later. I'll show you the finish even because this is going to probably go fairly close to Christmas would be my guess. Um, but I'll, I'll post up pictures of the finished uh, project when it gets done, so you can all see what it looks like. Because obviously, you know, it's not finished yet. Okay. So, uh, if you remember, we spent a bunch of time talking about uh, splicing, right? So, here we go. 
which is, where is that? Pardon me. This whole process of removing introns based on these splice acceptor sites, right? And so as we covered it, we pretty much were talking about how, oh, not that picture. Uh, where's a good picture of that? Where all these introns are removed and you end up with a mature RNA with just a contiguous open reading frame, right? one continuous code in sequence uh, that would then be translated. However, and this isn't something that applies to every gene, right? That's for sure. This actually, this kind of uh, removing all the introns is what applies to uh, all genes. However, because we have multiple exons and some genes have a huge number of exons, now we actually have the ability to leave parts of the gene out, right? And so, uh, oh, this is a insulin receptor. Sorry, just reading the the diagram, right? So, um, oh, that's interesting. So, actually, this is a really interesting thing to talk about. I'm just thinking about. Uh, uh, kind of biology in a broader sense, right? So, hey, E, Evie, don't forget I'm teaching. I can distract myself really well. <laughs> there you go. There's my daughter eating her breakfast. So, bigger picture stuff, right? Insulin is a signal that tells cells to take up glucose, right? And it typically does so when glucose levels exceed a certain threshold, right? That whole homeostasis deal. You want to maintain your glucose levels kind of bouncing between those upper and lower limits, right? It's not always the same, but it's kind of around the same. If glucose levels drop, you go uh, hypoglycemic, over low then you want glucose to be released, right? That's what happens when uh, glucagon is uh, sent around the body and glycogen is turned to glucose. When glucose levels go above that set point, now you need to remove glucose from the bloodstream because high glucose is actually toxic. Now, I'm not entirely sure how, but it causes all kinds of problems. And those are the problems you see in uh, people with uncontrolled diabetes, right? So like, you get weird like ulcers and stuff on their feet. You can go blind. Uh, again, I don't know why, but that's what happens. And so just in a normal kind of day, like, you know, I had my breakfast uh, probably about half an hour ago, give or take, running a little late today. And uh, right now, my uh, mini wheats are being digested and glucose is being taken up by my uh, bloodstream, right, from my intestines. And so my blood sugar levels is going up slowly, hopefully, because, you know, it's complex carbs, healthy breakfast, but it'll be start, start to go up. And so then my uh, pancreas, again, back to Mr. Pancreas or Mrs. Pancreas, I don't know which. Anyway, uh, my pancreas will sense that and release insulin. Now we have two targets for that insulin. They two different cell types. They both express the insulin receptor. And the insulin receptor basically tells those cells to take up in, uh, to take up glucose, right? However, we have differences in terms of how those cells respond, right, to insulin. So, how do we make two different cell types respond differently, right? We could control how much insulin receptor is present. Right, so it's a literally like a stochastic deal. We have fewer receptors, so there's uh, less ability to send signal. But that wouldn't quite do what we want. And so instead, what we have are different affinities for insulin. Same gene, same insulin receptor, but the insulin receptor in your liver has a lower affinity for, 
for insulin. What that means is it takes a lot more insulin to trigger a response, right? So the liver is like the uh, organ of last resort in a sense, right? The muscle instead, you want to be able to take up glucose at kind of, you know, whenever, right? Because you use a lot of glucose in your muscles to make ATP to do stuff. And so the insulin receptor in your muscle has a much higher affinity for insulin. So it only takes a little bit of insulin to trigger the response of taking gluco glucose up out of your bloodstream. And so the muscle, your skeletal muscle, like your you know, arm muscles and stuff, are what are the main player in modulating excess glucose levels, right? So your glucose levels goes up, your blood, uh, your muscles are going to take the glucose out of the blood first. And then if they are unable to do so, so the pancreas keeps releasing insulin, insulin levels get even higher. And now they trigger the liver to start doing so too. And the liver will turn that glucose into glycogen, which is a storage molecule. It's kind of equivalent to starch, essentially that you find in uh, plants, like glycogen is essentially the, the uh, animal equivalent. And so long story short, we have two different affinities of insulin receptor from the same gene due to alternative splicing. And so what that means is that in, uh, in the liver, all of the exons are removed uh, all of the introns, sorry, are removed and all of the exons remain. So you have the full length uh, coding region, CDS or open region frame for insulin, right? Now due to, I'd have to look at, well, actually I could even look at the protein structure. I wouldn't necessarily understand it any better. Um, but presumably this is something to do with protein structure, right? The physical structure of the insulin receptor that recognizes the insulin kind of flowing around in the blood and then initiates a response. In the muscle, however, one of those exons is skipped, right? So it's exon 11, this one here, instead of uh, taking out this and this, come on, get over there, right? in the, which is what happens in the liver. Now, instead, you take out the whole deal. So you take out the intron, the exon, and the intron. Hey. Get out. Right. I can, yeah, anyway. And so that essentially leaves uh, a truncated protein, right? But still, somehow, I don't actually understand how, uh, that's a functional protein, but it has an even higher affinity for insulin. So it must in some way change the physical shape of the pocket that recognizes the insulin protein. So it is able to bind it when there is much less insulin around, right? It's much more able to kind of grab it from the bloodstream than the one that's expressed in the liver. And so simply by changing the splicing uh, machinery, like how that happens. And again, I'd have to look into that in a lot more detail to figure out how, right? I know there are different uh, splicesomes, different uh, schnurps that are used. Um, don't necessarily know how that works in this case. But simply by excluding one of those exons, now you drastically change the biology of that system, right? And if you think about it in the bigger context, that makes a huge amount of sense, right? You don't want to preferentially take up glucose by your liver because the liver doesn't use, oh, well, it does use some glucose, right? In terms of detoxifying things, but your muscles and your brain are actually the biggest utilizers of energy in your body. 
And so, and I'm not sure how the brain does it. I'd have to look into that. Um, and so you really want glucose to preferentially go to the muscles first, right? And only if the muscles are kind of filling up and you're running out of places to put glucose, then you use the liver, right? Which is pretty cool. Actually, I think this is, this is an absolutely fabulous example because you get to talk about a lot of kind of bigger picture uh, biology. All right, so that's alternative splicing. So that's RNA processing. Now we can talk about RNA stability, right? And so way back, actually, I'm not even sure what PowerPoint that was in. Here we go, this will do. We talked about the five prime UTR and the three prime UTR, right? So the three prime UTR, we've kind of really covered it in terms of the poly A signal that gets added onto the end of it. And the five prime UTR, we've really talked about in terms of, where did that hand drawn picture go? Yeah. The five prime cap that gets added, right? However, the three prime UTR also has a huge role in stability. And so not all mRNAs are created equal in terms of their stability. And in many ways, the best way to turn off a gene, right? So all of this stuff up here is really talking about turning on a gene, right? chromatin being accessible, uh, activators, activating transcription, so on and so forth, right? However, at some point, you do not want to express that gene anymore, right? And so even if you stop transcription, you still have mRNA floating around in the cytoplasm or, you know, attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, whichever. So if you want to turn off gene expression, it doesn't, it's not just a case of stopping transcription. You also have to stop translation as well. And the way to do that is by destroying the mRNA. And so some genes, uh, they're actually called quite often housekeeping genes for uh, some reason I'm not entirely sure of, are always needed. Uh, their products are always needed ribosomes, uh, you know, structural proteins, things like that, right? And so those genes have very high stability. They're not expressed at very high levels, but their mRNAs hang around for a long time. However, if you want just a uh, transient expression, right? So you need to increase something just here and now right? You need to uh, increase insulin expression, right? To restock the levels of insulin in your pancreas. I, mean, I keep coming back to the pancreas for some reason. Anybody would think I'm obsessed. It's not actually my favorite organ. Anybody want to know what my favorite organ is? You can, you can do this at parties and dinner parties and stuff like that. It's a great topic of conversation. No one? Oh, fine. Anyway. All right, so <laughs> it's the kidney. Kidneys are awesome. That's my favorite organ. I love talking about kidneys. Anyway, I ended up talking about pancreases instead. Pancreas is uh, whatever kind of organ, but super important for us in a lot of reasons. So um, if you only want that gene to be turned on transiently, like for a short period of time, say you're responding to a particular condition, right? Whatever that might be. You want burst of gene product and then you want it off, right? This is actually the case in a lot in development. You've got to be able to get rid of that mRNA, right? And so the, one of the most important parts of the gene for that is actually the three prime UTR. Minutes. 
Nope. And the way that we do that is, uh, it's actually super, super cool. Is that um, the discovery of this was another uh, Nobel Prize. Actually, this was turned into a, an application, right? So this is actually a, a way that you can use this to futz up organisms called RNAi. And that's, uh, what are you doing, dog? And basically that's, uh, what you do is you feed an organism, hey, quit it. Uh, Double-stranded RNA that targets a gene of interest. And that equals uh, both Nobel Prize and a main uh, technique in my lab. So this is something that I do regularly. I actually just received like 10 different clones for genes that I need to uh, knock down to see what effect they have on something I'm interested in. So back to the actual deal. This is a little complicated, but the... The aim of the game here is we have to have a way of recognizing the transcripts, the mRNA molecules that we want to get rid of or inhibit, right? One of the two. And so the best way of doing that is to produce a piece of RNA that matches them. Does that make sense? Oh, get off of it, dogs. Honestly, this is going to be one of those days. It's very hard to stay mad at them, though, particularly this one. Even though she is a complete and total pest. Yeah, I know, exactly. It's like, she's the cutest one. No, she's the most pain in the butt one. So, the idea here is that there's going to be a region in that three prime UTR, right? In here, that a piece of RNA, right? And this is going to be produced by another gene, recognizes, right? So these, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, mRNA killer RNAs are produced by non-coding genes, right? So remember we talked about these a while back, right? These are genes that produce mRNAs, but they don't produce proteins. So anyway, these genes produce uh, short RNA molecules, and those recognize the three prime UTR in their target genes. And so really, in a way, they act like a barcode, right, like a scanner. And so the way that it works is we've got two different um, kind of paths to this, right? And they kind of vary in, should I put it in the notes? No, I don't know, I need to do that. Um, two different kind of approaches, essentially, right? And so we have, uh, don't even think about it. We have small interfering RNAs and we have micro RNAs. Micro RNAs are more about endogenous gene expression control, so controlling your own stuff. Small interfering RNAs are more about uh, destroying invading viruses, right? It's kind of the slight difference between them. But either way, those genes produce RNAs that are either a stem loop, right? So they pepper. They have this uh, secondary structure or double-stranded. Either way, those are recognized. Let me just blow this up a bit. 
dog, will you stop it? By an enzyme called DISA. What DISA does is it chops those uh, larger pieces of RNA into smaller chunks, usually around 25 nucleotides or so. Right. Once those are Once those are broken up into little chunks, those are then recognized by another group of proteins. These are called uh, RISC, which stands for RNA-induced silencing complex. I'm going to have to put this into my uh, annual evaluations my ability to teach with a growling dog sitting on the couch next to me as part of my you know, faculty development. So what that does is it recognizes short uh, double-stranded RNA molecules, right? Which you shouldn't have hanging around normally, right? Because mRNA does not form short double-stranded RNA molecules. That's uh, shorten that to dsRNA. That's also how this works as a kind of cellular immunity against viruses, because uh, you know there are many viruses that have double-stranded RNA genomes, right? So again, that's something like a little bit alien. Dog. Yeah, funny for you, bloody annoying for me, quit it. Right. And what it does is it will chop up one of those strands and use the other one as a scanning mechanism, a barcode. Can you actually hear that through the mic, just out of curiosity? No? Oh, well, right. What it does is it turns that uh, it turns it into single stranded RNA, and it has to be single stranded RNA because of the whole base pair complementarity deal, right? So essentially, you need single piece of RNA, single stranded RNA, to be able to kind of find that mRNA molecule. Hey, stop it. Will you just quit it? All right, I got to type one handed now because I'm holding on to my dog's nose with the other one. Right. And then uses that small piece of single, sorry, I have to forgive my hand, Ryan, uh, RNA as a um, basically scanning tool to look for uh, matching or complementary uh, sort of mRNA. That's that's the idea. All right, so let's gonna go see how that works. And so an argonaut is one of those proteins. I don't know why it's called argonaut, but um, 
what it does is it find it recognizes solely those small pieces, right? So that's why we need Dicer up here to generate those, right? And Dicer will only recognize these types of double-stranded RNA. So it's not going to go chopping up tRNAs and stuff like that. It recognizes very specific uh, dsRNA pieces. So once that's in the right state, then the risk can recognize those small chunks and it gets rid of one of the strands, right? And that leaves what's called a guide strand. And essentially what risk then does is it carries that guide strand around and basically goes, does this match, right? It's trying to find mRNA molecules that that guide strand matches. Right. And if it matches, right, and it depends on how well it matches, if it matches perfectly, right, or I think there's a maximum of three bases that uh, can be wrong for this to work. If it matches or matches nearly perfectly, that will then cause the mRNA to be degraded. So a perfect or near perfect match. And I think it's like, I don't know, say 18 or 19 out of 22 base pairs. I think it's 22 for siRNA. Equals a cut of the three prime UTR of the target mRNA. Now, if you have now a free end, what's going to happen to the mRNA? Right. So now we have a piece of mRNA, which was protected at either end by the five prime cap and the three prime, uh, the poly A tail, right? Poly A binding proteins. If you cut that mRNA, what's now got going to happen to that mRNA molecule? Yeah, it's going to get degraded by RNases because now RNases recognize a free three prime end and they'll glom onto it and they'll just chop it up. So that equals degradation, as Stephanie said, by RNases. Now, if the match isn't perfect, right? So this is a way of kind of essentially affecting a larger group of molecules, right? And it has to be, oh, I can tell you exactly what it is, say between, uh, as an example, I'm not 100% sure of the numbers, say between 10 and 18 base pair matching. Instead, uh, this complex bound to the three prime UTR, and this is as far as I'm aware, always a three prime UTR thing. I'm not aware of, I'm not an expert at this by any stretch, but I don't think this happens on the five prime UTR. Basically prevents the uh, poly A binding proteins from interacting with the um, small ribosomal subunit and prevents initiation of translation. So the outcome is essentially the same. It's less severe, right? So in this case, the mRNA is simply degraded, it's gone, right? So you'll never get translation from that mRNA. I'm not sure how permanent the inhibition of translation is, but you can see it's kind of a little bit of a less severe option. But the outcome from both is no translation, right? So if you want to turn off a gene, you would not only stop transcribing it, but also you would 
use one of these mechan mechanisms to stop translating it, right? Because again, what you care about is, do we have functional protein at the end? Doesn't matter so much how you get to that uh, point, but if you don't want it, you've got to stop it at some point along uh, that process. And uh, siRNA, as I said, this has been very much uh, co-opted, I guess, into a actual technique called RNAi, right? And so in worms, at least in C. elegans, um, all you need to do is you, you uh, clone part of the gene that you want to target. And there's actually, back in Penn State in my former labs minus 80 freezer, there's a library of, I can't remember how many plates, quite a few, uh, like 20 or so, of almost every single gene of C. elegans, about 20,000 different clones. And each one of those bacteria has a little bit of a specific gene cloned into it, such that when that bacteria expresses that uh, little gene, it creates a double-stranded RNA molecule. And so you feed the worms that bacteria and via, it's kind of a bit of a borderline between science and magic, the worms actually take up that double-stranded RNA and it shuts down gene expression of just that gene, right? It doesn't work perfectly, right? So it's much more variable than a gene knockout. So a mutation, like a loss of function mutation. Uh, but you can do it at any stage, right? So, and you can do it to worms which are perfectly normal, knock down expression of a particular gene and then look at the outcome essentially of uh, the lack of that gene product. It's an astonishingly powerful technique and one that I've used pretty exhaustively over the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years, I guess. So if you've got a little bit left to do, kind of spend a little bit longer uh, grumbling at my dogs and showing you them at the uh, secret project. Um, but just want to leave, uh, we've got a couple of, uh, we'll finish these off on, on Wednesday. A um, couple of examples. But the point that I want to get off in the last, across in the last couple of minutes is that Production of protein is not the end, right? After protein is translated and folded as well, which is another story in and of itself, once you get a folded three-dimensional protein, for some proteins, for some genes, that's the end of the road, right? You have a functional protein. That protein can then go and do whatever that protein is supposed to do. However, for many proteins, and this is actually a very common deal, those proteins can then be modified in lots and lots of different ways, right? They can be cut up. Insulin is actually a great example of that. Oh, hard life, huh? Sorry. Look at that. Life of a dog, huh? So insulin has to be cleaved uh, in several places, actually, to be functional. Uh, the addition of various functional groups, uh, addition of sugars, right? That's very common on proteins that are actually on the cell surface, so outward-facing proteins. And these modifications can have lots of different effects. Right, they can target it to particular places in the cell. It can affect whether it's functional or not, activate it or deactivate it. Right, they can be transient or permanent. Right, there's lots and lots of stuff going on here. So, this is really an entire other world, in a sense, in addition to what we've been learning about gene expression. This is just a whole nother world of changes that really affect how well these things work or not. And so I'll go through those two examples on Wednesday. 
and uh, they're pretty cool. One of them's actually been the, the work that I'm going to show you is done by a friend of mine, which is pretty neat. And yeah, and that's that. So uh, that's it for me for today. Also, bring any questions that you have about any of this stuff with you on Wednesday. We'll have time to do that. And uh, I'll uh, knock together some fun stuff about transgenics as well. I think we've got some stuff on CRISPR-Cas9 that I really want to talk about, which is super neat. Cool. All right. That's it from me. Have a lovely day. It looks beautiful out there. And the dogs and I shall see you soon.